I might just quickly introduce our panel as they come up. We have Rob Martin, who's creeping onto stage now. He's the uh, Melbourne director of the City Bible Forum, uh, and he hosts a radio show called Logos Live, which engages with the big questions of life. He speaks, writes, and blogs about the intersection of Christianity and modern culture, and he's married to Di, and they have three children. And James over there um, is the president of the uh, University of Melbourne Secular Society. Um, he is the leader of the uh, Melbourne EA movement, uh, the Melbourne EA chapter, that is, and he is my recent housemate. It's been an interesting process, but I've enjoyed it, James. <laughs> We'll get you some microphones. If uh, James could firstly answer, do you think Leon uh, should identify as an effective altruist? Do I think Leon should identify as an effective altruist? Uh, hmm. Well, I think a lot of people should identify as effective altruists. Um, my, and I know EAs differ about this, and Leon um, sort of highlighted that. My personal opinion is that EA should be, um, it would be better off being a, a broader movement. So um, I don't think everyone needs to be, you know, sort of card carrying hardcore sort of utilitarians um, of the sort that, you know, maybe many of us are, but I, I think that the fundamental idea of effective altruism is about, um, probably I would lean towards sort of the, the softer um, definition, I think you called it, the, the one that you started with, about using reason and evidence to do, um, you know, the more good or as much good as we can or something like that. I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, but um, I think if, if people are broadly online, um, in line with that ideal, I think it's... I would call them EAs, or I would feel very comfortable with themselves calling themselves EAs, I suppose. Um, I don't think they need, there's sort of what, um, a creed or something that the people need to sign up to, to, to be EAs, basically. Well, good if I just, well, hi everyone, and it's nice to be part of this. If I may maybe respond to that and suggest, well, if that's the case, I think that Leon and I, I mean, I would be happy to convert, perhaps, <laughs> to, 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 towards a, an EA philosophy because I think it's, it's deeply resonant with a lot in the Christian worldview and I think I'm very deeply attracted to a lot of the ideas of actually wanting to, to actually make sure what I do actually does make a difference in the world. As, a, I mean, as uh, Leon mentioned, that a key aspect of, of Christian morality is to consider the Good Samaritan, loving others. Uh, and so actually if there's a, a mechanisms and ways in which we can actually do that and actually say that, well, my, what I give does actually love my neighbour and actually does that, then I think, well, I'll convert today. Yeah, Leon, that's, that's good. I was hoping that there might be a, someone who might at least have acknowledged that. <laughs> Perhaps I could just go back to you, Rob, then, maybe on a slightly different topic. Sure. Can you just quickly just give us a bit of background? What's been your uh, exposure to the EA movement uh, thus far? Why are you interested um, well, as yeah. I've mentioned before, as I said, it's very deeply consistent, I think, within a Christian, aspects of it are deeply consistent within a Christian worldview. I suppose my involvement is, uh, uh, I've, I've met obviously through James and yourself, I've had a number of conversations, I've written a bit of a critique of EA, I attend, I, I've heard some of uh, Peter Singer's reflections and philosophy on the topic, so I suppose, again, I, I miss my observations and uh, uh, involvement is, I suppose, a mixture of admiration and frustration. Admiration for the for the for the goals and for some of the the deep sacrifices that people have been willing to take in this, but I suppose the frustration comes again as what Leon identified as some of the deeper philosophical questions, and that perhaps in the the scope question is where I, I find the frustrations because I have some deep reservations about a, a full blown consequentialist utilitarian philosophy. Mm. Maybe we could. I want to sort of draw you out, Rob, more on your objections to the effective altruism movement, or what particularly grades. Are you able to talk a little bit more to that point? Sure. I mean, I'm happy to do that. I mean, I don't want to, to dominate our conversation, and I do want it to be... Uh, I don't want to throw any punches or anything. And I'm, We can <laughs> save the violence for our side, if you like. Yeah. Uh, sorry, not, not that I'm suggesting violence. I suppose it's just that, that generally my, my reservations are with the... Um, in a number of areas, but I suppose they're just consistent with the, the weaknesses of a, of a consequentialist philosophy in general. Uh, for example... Uh, Whilst I think it's fantastic to me to try to work out what are the best consequences, but we can never really know. We can never actually properly work out what are the best consequences because and I think this is where, um, in a Christian perspective, understanding the sovereignty of God, that he's actually in control and that I can trust that my decisions, whilst, whilst based on imperfect information, I can trust that my decisions actually uh, I can trust are for the greater good. Whereas in a consequentialist ide ideology, I, I actually have to try to figure out and, I, and it could lead to great guilt, anguish and frustration that I may not actually make a decision at all or I might have looked back on my life and actually think, well, I actually made the wrong decision. I should have done this. 
Uh, and I think that's a, that's a deep weakness within the consequentialist philosophy. But, I mean, isn't that just a fact that, you know, sometimes we make the wrong decision? Um, I don't see how it's a weakness of a utilitarian philosophy that we sometimes make the wrong decisions, we have imperfect information, sometimes we have regrets. That seems just a fact of life to me. Oh, absolutely. But, but I suppose it's just the, the idea that if, if this consequentialist philosophy is the way that I uh, conduct my life uh, and then it determines what is morally right or wrong, then I need to know what the consequences are going to be for me to actually make the right or wrong decision. Yeah, that's right. So the extent to which we're able to determine the likely or the expected consequences of an action is going to uh, very sh sh sharply determine sort of how effective we can be. And that's sort of the, the point of effective altruism. I think, I guess I'm slightly um, unclear about the nature of the critique. It seems to be saying that um, we would sort of like to know more about, you know, what, what the consequences would be. And because we can't know as much as we would like, that therefore we, we shouldn't, you know, base our decisions on those consequences. Um, and it, it seems to me that that doesn't follow. Like, if consequences are what matters, which is what utilitarians or consequentialists say, then um, that's sort of true independent of whether we can know very well what those are. Maybe it's the case that consequences are what matters, um, but it's really hard to know what they are in a lot of cases. And I, I think that Correct. That's plausibly that's is right. the case. Yeah. So that makes it very difficult to then make a, make a judgment as to what is the best outcome, what is the best decision to make now, given that the consequences are, un are uncertain. James, what do you make of uh, Leon's point that perhaps Peter Singer has been going to lengths to appeal to a more virtue ethics sort of oriented person in his latest book? Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, it, yeah, Singer does make remarks on those lines. Um, I don't know, I can't psychologize Singer. I'm not, sorry. Did you? Yeah, that's all right. I, I, I didn't mean to say that he was going out of his way, although I think <laughs> he generally does go out of his way, including like all, all the way. I mean, in the original Famine, Affluence and Morality, I think he also goes out of his way not to. Um, to, to assume as little of utilitarianism as, um, as possible. But I more mean that the, the actual argument of the book, the overall structure of the book, is you can be fulfilled and do a lot of good. And, I, I, you know, and, and doing a lot of good is fulfilling. I think that is actually fundamentally a virtue ethical argument. Yeah, I mean, so hmm, there's a number of ways one can look at that. So, so you could adopt a consequentialist standpoint looking at why Singer wrote the book the way he did. So what, what, what would get people to do more good? Um, a sort of a hardcore utilitarian argument about why it would maximise global utility um, to you know, be an effective altruist or the line that he did to take, which is you know, some of that sort of uh, argument, but also um, focusing on yeah, how you can flourish while doing good. I think it's quite plausible the latter is um, more motivating to a lot of people. And so, I mean, you know, I can't say why Singer wrote it exactly the way he did, but it seems quite plausible to me that that's a reasonable thing to do as an effective altruist, to try and encourage people as best as we can. I didn't mean that as a criticism. No, 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 no I, <laughs> I'm not saying you did. <laughs> can I jump in? This is a point that was raised in some of our earlier discussions. Uh, we called it the too demanding critique. That is that utilitarianism in, in or any form of consequentialism inevitably leads to a more is always better, therefore we should always do more. This quickly becomes too demanding. Um, how do we deal with that? Can I hear thoughts from anyone? Well, I'll just quickly respond. I suppose, again, it comes back to Leon's point about the nature of the scope, about to, to what extent you see this as an over, uh, overarching uh, philosophical concept, or is it just something that's really good to do? I suppose that's the... That's the if that question's resolved, I think that answer of uh, the demanding nature of it will be resolved. Maybe Leon might add something to that. Yeah, I, I don't think the demandingness objection is actually sort of a logical objection. I think, I think it's okay. You know, if that really were ethically the way things are, that, that would be all right. So I, I you know, and, and I think Christianity is extremely demanding as well. <laughs> um, so I, I don't think the demandingness objection is really an objection. I think that, um, that yeah, really, well, I mean, my objections are more on the along the line of I don't see why one should take the point of view of the universe and I don't know if utility is an actual thing. You know, it, it sometimes pe people attach numbers to it and so on. I actually had a conversation with Hillary about this. I possibly don't understand the area well enough. But um, it seems to me that if, if, for example, I were in charge of uh, Australians' health, I could decide to uh, maximise people's health by coming up with a number that represents every individual's health and trying to maximise the sum and so on. But I don't think that would, you know, that, could, that would be a strategy. That wouldn't be that there is actually some sort of numerical measure of health um, which I ought to be trying to maximise. And I, I don't know why. Uh, I, I, I have, perhaps I haven't read the arguments, but it seems odd to me that there is this thing, utility, which is sort of objectively 
the best thing to maximise it. Yeah. But, but I don't think the demandingness objection is a very good objection. Just with regards to the demandingness one, because, I mean, yeah, Leon, you've said that you don't particularly think it's a good objection. It is one that comes up quite commonly, at least in my experience, about EA. You know, why, why, is it, why, are we all, why aren't we all wearing, you know, sackcloths and whatever else and um, spending every last cent that we have? Um, and there's various answers to, to that particular critique. But um, I think the point is it. well, I think it, it, it illustrates a misunderstanding of what, what utilitarian or consequentialist uh, theories in particular try and do. Um, there's, I, I can't remember which philosopher said this, but that you know, um, consequentialism or utilitarianism in particular, it, it judges actions, it doesn't judge men or people. Um, the idea is to say, you know, what's the right action to take? And it's not really interested in sort of making a comparison between people, oh, this person's doing more good than this and saying who's um, morally praiseworthy. P Peter Singer actually talked about, you know, wh whom we should praise, and that's actually really an independent question uh, in some sense. It's more sort of socially uh, dependent about what's the norm in society, and I, I think I agree with that. So, you know, um, in some sense, I'm happy to say you know, all of us could do more. It doesn't matter how effective and altruist you are. There's always more that can be done, and I don't think anyone's maximally perfect in how altruistic they are, and if, if, we're ha if we like, admit, I think, which is an obvious fact, then it, it shouldn't come as a surprise that, you know, we can always do more. You okay for me to move us on to a slightly different topic? Great. Okay, I've got a question from the audience. In fact, I've got about 20, so thank you for, for <laughs> that. Uh, but this, this is one that, that resonated with me. Um, it's certainly one that I thought about a little bit at, when, I was, when I was calling myself a Christian, and that is, um, is converting to people Christianity effective good? Maybe I'll rephrase the question. Um, how do you weigh up uh, focusing on building, I guess, the Christian movement, the, propagating the Christian worldview, which you believe has, has huge uh, positive benefits, versus, say, giving to the Women of the World initiative? Um, how do you make those sorts of judgments? Yeah, so, so this is where I think the demandingness objection comes in, and there is a point to be made, because... The reality is that if you are a really consistent utilitarian, almost, almost everyone does seem to fudge. There seems to be a sense of, you know, oh, well, if, if I were to sort of worry about it too much, then I wouldn't be happy anymore, and that would sort of lower, lower the total happiness or, or whatever. I don't, I don't think a consistent utilitarian should sort of fudge like this. Um, and I, I think as well, if, I, I think I, I'm sort of being thoroughly not utilitarian. I see the trade-off between deworming the world and supporting the church or um, mission around the world as very similar, if not analogous to the trade-off that we all make between supporting deworming the world and, you know, um, anything that we spend on ourselves. I don't think there's a sort of a category altruism within which I have to be absolutely as effective as possible and that includes uh, charity and the church and then a category spending on myself and it's just a matter of where we sort of set the line. Um, can, can we? Do you have anything to add, Rob? I'm sure. I'm, sure, so I'm just trying to clarify what exactly you want. What, what exactly you want a response to? The okay. Put it this way: When I was a Christian, the way I would I'd struggle with this because I'd have a limited amount of money. Mm -hmm. I would want to support my church, and I would want to give a lot of money to give well recommended charities. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know how to do that split. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm. Yeah. No. Okay. I, I in, think. So just to just clarify, and in conversations, um, especially with with Christian friends, with religious friends. Uh, this becomes particularly relevant because they're, that's the sort of uh, decision mm. they're trying to make. Mm -hmm. uh, so I suppose in many ways it's the question of how do I allocate scarce resources to lots and lots of competing problems or issues that I see. Uh, and I suppose the, the Christian response, uh, again, comes to, I think, to the idea of whole-of-life worship, so that everything that I do is in response to what I've been given and what I've been entrusted with and the resources. So it means that it's not simply about separating well, I've got some money here, or I can do this to, to earn money, but it's also the way I live and the way I, I live, conduct my life. So, for example, uh, the, the idea of uh, fair trade is a, is a classic one. So when I drink a cup of coffee, um, rather than just thinking, well, I'm just going to give this amount of money as the, the, the portion of my life that I'm going to spend here, uh, this is the portion of money I'm going to give to the church, and this is the money, money, amount of money I have myself, the Christian worldview actually says that everything I do is in response to, to God's grace to me. So, therefore, when I buy a coffee, well, I actually have to think through the ethical decisions that go on in buying a coffee. So, hence, I should consider the, the background of the people who have produced that. And so, I'll leave it, I'll buy a cup of coffee. It also means that we should be generous and give money away. But then, in terms of determining where that money goes, well, again, this, has become, this is where the whole utilitarian concept becomes complex because it will depend on what we value and what we see is important. 
So to the atheist utilitarian, they'd say that well, giving Bibles to the people in the developing world or in Africa is a complete waste of resources. Yet a, a Christian would actually say, well, actually, this is, to us, this is one of the, the greatest gifts we could possibly give. And so hence we should do we give that. Now, that doesn't mean to, that that is given uh, an exclusion to helping material benefits, but it makes it, the decision very complicated. But I think, so, sorry to interrupt, but I think this is exactly where the tension lies because I think you can be, suppose Christianity were true, then arguably giving Bibles to the people in Africa is the most effective people, uh, sorry, most effective thing we could do, like, arguably at least. And I think the question would be, then how would we allocate scarce resources between Bibles or malaria nets or you know, whatever it is? And it seems to me that we do actually have to make that decision. It's a very practical decision. The utilitarian or at least the consequentialist has at least a theoretical framework for making that decision, um, weighing up the consequences. Doing that is difficult, but that's the framework. It's unclear what the framework um, one has if one does not adopt that framework. How does one actually decide how many Bibles, how many malaria nets? I'm very comfortable with having an ethical framework in which there is not an exact answer to such questions, even in principle. Well, I didn't say there was an exact answer, but is there any approach at all other than just sort of... Yeah. I, Whatever. I, like, well, it doesn't seem that there's any way of deciding that decision. No, I think, I think there is. Well, just to come back to the original thing, I think there is actually a biblical principle that the reason why you give to the church is because people who work for the church deserve an income. That's, that's it. Yeah, let's, um, let's, yeah, let's assume we're talking about a marginal donation that you don't feel obliged one way or the other. Sure. Gotcha. So that's a fair, sorry, that's a fair clarification. Yep. Well, I think the, the, the key question is, is about wisdom. And so that's, that, that it gives, a, I think, great freedom and flexibility to, don, to donate to causes. And this is where effective altruism can really help, is by actually saying, well, these organisations, if you give um, mosquito nets in these particular countries, it's going to save X number of lives. Well, actually, that's a really good thing to do, and it's a good thing to know. But I wouldn't want to pit that against alternative other ways of, of helping or doing good in the world, particularly from a broad-based Christian philosophy. So, for example, uh, is it worthwhile advocating against corruption in developed worlds, so developing countries, where uh, you say, well, I could give X amount of dollars to save X number of lives, but in the longer term, a perhaps a broader, better solution would be to advocate against uh, corruption. Uh, and in the Christian worldview, you'd actually argue that one of the best ways of dealing with corruption or systemic corruption is actually by the preaching of the gospel because it leads to people's lives transformed who want to actually obey the law rather than corrupt it. And so it just becomes very complex and it's an interrelated, interrelated uh, web. Uh, and I think <laughs> I don't want to mandate or suggest a law that someone has to follow, that this is the, these are the best ways you should do this. I think, again, it's all of life that we do uh, the most good that we can do given the broad-based sort of philosophical framework that we come from. Um, and then sometimes just have to make wise decision based based on our circumstances. I, mean, I don't. I, I agree with a lot of that. I, absolutely, things are complicated, and we need to use wisdom and prudence. Um, and at the same time, though, I think that at least at one point you said something like you don't want to weigh um, sort of weigh up or apportion out um, different uses of, of funds or of limited resources against different good causes. So we don't want to simply do that. I think there's an element yeah. to which you should budget, and you should well, actually. I think have we a, have to like. In an actual decision, like any church, any organisation has a limited amount of funds, and it cannot do, it cannot do, it do as many, put out as many Bibles and as many malaria nets as we would like, and so they have to make a good decision about how to apportion those resources. Correct. To, 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 to be fair, sorry. To be fair, if I were to ask you the same question of, you know, how much should you apportion to the global per, poor versus how much should you apportion to wild animal activism? The reality is, you know, it, it's, it's a matter of just pulling numbers out of a hat. Well, effectively pulling numbers out of a hat, or at least using very, very uncertain numbers. And the only difference is that I, and possibly we, don't claim that there's a unique principle or a unique answer, whereas the utilitarian might say, well, you know, I am trying to sort of approximate a sum over so many billion lives of an integral over, you know, their total mind states, yeah. you know, pleasurable mind states minus suffering. Well, I think what, like what the utilitarian is saying is, here's, this is the framework, these are the things we don't know, um, and yeah, there's a lot of work we need to do in finding out these things. It seems that if you abandon that framework, it's not even clear what it is that we don't know that we would need to find out. It's, it, it, there seems to be a, an even higher level of uncertainty as to what even the question is that we would need to answer. I'd say that also exists for effective altruism, as we've heard over the last few days. <laughs> yeah. No, there are, there are tensions everywhere. You're, you're right about Let's that. Let's move to a, a final question, which is, is related and somewhat more practical. That is, how do you think we should go about marketing to a church group in order to move philanthropic resources towards Give Well recommended charities? I think I came this morning and heard about deworming the world. 
uh, heard about the great good that an organisation like that does. And I think that resonates very deeply with the Christian ethic of loving my neighbour. And I think I want to I wanna deem in the world as well. I'd love to give to that. And I think the, the idea of that uh, suggesting that Christians are somehow a different category of person, they actually want to... <laughs> is, is, sometimes can be uh, unhelpful. Um, well, I think it's very unhelpful, actually, in many ways. Um, I re- really am a person. Um, but... <laughs> But they, but they have often, and certainly the way that the Christians have been portrayed in some uh, areas of the media, most Christian people I know are genuinely loving, caring people who really want to do a great deal of difference to the world and really want to love people wherever it is. Sometimes it's just a matter of education and actually saying these are some really great charities or some great uh, organisations out there doing some really practical good things and I think a Christian can get on board and say, yep, I want to help DWM the world as well. So, so my concern with this sort of thing is that um, effective altruism is perceived to be, and I think largely because this is mostly accurate, a fairly secular um, movement. And basically, I don't see w- why that should be, because you know, from what we've seen, I mean, it, there's a very large amount of overlap between the fundamental concerns. So, like, what can we actually do to improve that? <coughs> so I can just respond. Oh, let's, sorry, I don't want to jump into. I just like speaking. That's right, one of the reasons. Sorry, I, which, is, which is a problem at times. <laughs> But I think one of the, my, my response to that is it's partly due to the philosophical framework in which it's framed. If it comes from a, 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 this is what, as I said, my, my, part of my frustration comes from the utilitarian framework. If it does come from that, I, I'm not quite sure Christians can uh, embrace that in such the same way because there is a difficult, different ethical system operating. Sorry, Leon. Yeah, I mean, I think effective altruism is not just secular. It's also like male. It's also connected with, you know, the uh, sort of San Francisco tech boom, entrepreneurial culture and so on. Um, so I think there are a lot of things going on there. One, one strategy might be that um, if, if you remember the Make Poverty History campaign, and actually I'd love to hear an effective altruist evaluation of that because that may have moved an awful lot of money. But um, there was a parallel campaign called the MICA Challenge, which was essentially a Christian adjunct um, and it involved churches doing sort of parallel activism with um, Make Poverty History and with additional Christian reasons for doing so. So maybe there could be something like that. Yeah, and I'd, I'd be interested. If anyone's actually, like, I'm interested in this, I'd be, I'd be interested in and happy to sort of promote it and think about it. So if anyone's got any ideas, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's interesting that the, the consequentialist um, sort of framing is potentially of putting, because I think that comes back to what Leon was saying about the way Singer's phrased his or, um, most recent book is maybe less reliant on that and more, more in virtue ethics. So perhaps, I don't know, we could just put the idea out there that as consequentialists, we might have better consequences by being less consequentialist, at least in the way we present <laughs> ourselves and ideas. That's right. You, <laughs> arguably, arguably. You should, don't, don't worry about integrity at all. Just be completely cynical. I didn't say that, Leon. I, I didn't people. say that. It's true. Thank you. Thanks, guys. We're going to have to wrap it up there. And thank you for all your questions. And we're very sorry we didn't get to very many of them at all. Please approach these guys afterwards and harass them. That would be fantastic. But I'm going to pass back to our MCs. Please thank our panelists. (laughs) 